metal. Let's wait. We are just four, but uh, I think we start. So, good morning. And uh, today we finish the discussion about the, the compactness of, uh, in LP spaces. And so, the theorem that we had was uh, um, so if F, okay, sorry. Theorem is about strong compactness. So we have a, a, a set F bounded and uh, uh, subject translations are uniformly continuous. So tau maps to translation, so tau, sorry, um, h, tau h f minus f, p, and, uh, uh, okay, p is between 1 and infinity, 
otherwise translation, well, is, is generally is not continuous. Uh, this is uh, uniformly continuous. So uniformly we expect to F. Then, okay, then the, for each subset of, uh, so for all omega contained in Rn, the measure of omega is less than plus infinity, we deduce that uh, the set F restricted in omega, where f is in f, is strongly free compact. So its closure is compact. And this tau h is the operator, the translation operator. Of f minus h, depending on. OK. So this was the theorem. And uh, the, if you remember the proof, more or less, let's have a sketch. Proof. So you take, uh, yeah, let, let's make a drawing. So let's say this is F, just to And now you take the set, uh, which is of convolutions. N is a convolution kernel or approximation of identity or regularized kernel, whatever you like. So I call it convolution kernel. So the, and then uh, if you apply this convolution kernel to F, well, you obtain a different set, which is uh, chocks. This is Fn, rho n convoluted with F. But the estimate is that uh, since I have a uniformly continuous uh, approximation, sorry, um, I have a uniformly continuous, uh, is uniformly continuous by translation, if you remember, I have that rho n F minus F LP is, uh, well, in omega of finite measure, but the, the, well, it doesn't matter, sorry, it is, doesn't matter. It's just equal, and then, well, you have the boundedness, and then you have the human for continuity, so at the end you get that this is a, a function which depends on one over n, for example. So for all f. So the thing is that, uh, oh, I discover that if I give any points here, the distance is uh, of the order, is uniform. So it's 1, 1 over n. OK? Now, the second step is to study this set Fn. So Fn is contained in C infinity of Rn, because it's the convolution, so in particular. So, and then, OK, with the uniform estimate. So the, the, end, the, the, the estimate depends on n, for, but for example, the gradient, the important one is the gradient. Well, the n infinity norm is trivial, but the gradient is uh, uh, so remember that this is less than well you have the norm of f p norm of gradient of rho n let's say one or well we have uh, the the estimate this is uh, I can just estimate or the constant and then infinity. And OK, and I'm very happy because it turns out that uh, so it's bounded by some constant and the function of n, for example, it's uh, um, if I scale by one of n, this is n to the 
times n. Okay, if I'm well, if I uh, the estimate the infinity estimate is n to the power capital n, depending which estimate you prefer. But in any case, it's uniformly bounded, so I deduce that uh, f n when I restrict to any compact set is pre-compact in C0. Then in particular is pre-compact in LP. Or doesn't matter if I can extend them to zero outside. Okay, so these sets here are pre-compact when restricted to a compact set. So uh, I have now to make use of the assumption So this guy here, this guy here has finite measure and then by regularity in a regularity of measures So what I discover, I discover that, uh, well, there exists a K such that uh, compact K contained in omega and K omega minus K is as small as I want. Now, if I look again at this uniform approximation, then uh, I can choose, uh, so, it means that I can choose, uh, an, uh, so I can choose a set K in order to have that uh, for all F, so again by point one, I need to use. So I'm, I must be sure that the mass is not concentrated in the complement of K. And this is true simply because I have a uniform estimate. So it's not possible that you concentrate the mass because otherwise this estimate is false. If you want to try, I mean, I'm presenting the proof slightly different. Uh, I follow the line, but then try, to, but this is, we will see next, next by point one. Um, so F, LP in omega minus K, is less than uh, my choice, for example, epsilon, doesn't matter, uniform. Okay, so now we are, now the result is done. Because uh, it follows, so last step, So prove that uh, the set is, dot, uh, is uh, so prove that F restricted to omega is totally bounded. And I think it's a good exercise to prove that in matrix spaces, totally bounded means uh, pre-compact, but it is an exercise. So F is totally bounded by, so totally bounded means that for all epsilon there exist fi finitely many balls of center i and radius epsilon, here is in LP because we are in LP, such that, uh, so i equal to 1 to capital I, such that uh, F is contained in the, the union of these finitely many balls. Okay, how to do that? Well, by, well, by see the drawing, let's say the drawing. So I take, uh, so I know that this distance, for example, let's say this is epsilon, and then I have that uh, I remove, uh, I, I take a compact set, so uh, I, I add again another epsilon. So when I restrict my functions, I get a new set Let's say this is 
Fn restricted to the compact set. And well, the distance of this guy is again epsilon at most. So the total distance from here should be 2 epsilon. Now how to do that? Okay, I cover now this set with balls of radius epsilon. And I can do that with finitely many because uh, this uh, purple set Fn is restricted to K is compact or is pre-compact. Okay? By Asko Yazera. And now you enlarge the ball. So each ball is enlarged to 3 epsilon. From epsilon, you go to 3 epsilon. And you see that uh, since uh, I have a point inside Fn restricted to k whose distance is 2 epsilon and another point whose distance is uh, epsilon, the center of the ball, then I have certainly a center of the ball which covers my full set. Okay, so this is the sketch of the proof. So now we have to... Um, work a little bit on uh, the, this assumption here. So what can go wrong and why I need to take uh, compact set, sorry, sets with finite mesh. So if you see from here, well, I need compact sets simply because I want to use ascoli Arzela here. And uh, this result is true with finite measure, but actually what I need is this object, no? that uniformly, if you remove a compact set, the mass is small for all f, is uniformly small. So if you, uh, I think I asked last time, if you know the notion of tightness. The question, the answer is no. I don't remember, I don't remember. You said no, somebody said yes, I think. You said no, Professor. I think. No. Okay, so the definition works. Uh, okay, for measures, no. So let's uh, let's take a measure. Have you seen measure in uh, metric spaces? Well, uh, okay. Let's say just in general. Sorry, it's better to do in general. So me which is uh, alpha is uh, contained in the measure of some set is tight. Let's say it is uh, with probability. Let's say they are bounded. So they take probability space. Tight. If for all epsilon there exists a, a compact set such that the measure, so the supremum of the measure of uh, uh, omega minus k is less than epsilon. So it says that, uh, uh, well, essentially the mass remains uh, close to uh, bounded sets or close to compact sets. And if you see, it's exactly this observation here. So in our case, no, oh, sorry, just a remark, let's say, a remark. This notion rules out mass escaping to infinity. Because you can have, uh, for example, a delta over n, where n is a natural number, is not tight.
mass have fallen to infinity, and uh, indeed this is, I mean, one of the examples. So the notion we are interested now is uh, the notion, that notion apply to F, to the family of function in LP. So now we say F contained in LP is tight. Okay, now for, uh, well, if, uh, let's say, for all epsilon, there exists K contained in Rn. So here we work in Rn just for simplicity, compact, such that <coughs> the supremum over F of the LP norm in the, in the complement is less than epsilon. Okay, so it says that, uh, well, uh, the mass of F cannot flow to infinity. Well, it's clear, that I, uh, just an exercise. If, let's say, norm of F, well, let's say if F not, nigh, not tight, then it is not compact. And why is that so? Because so here as course I, I need to assume one and infinity. Eh? We don't work in L infinity because the norm is too strong. So it's not compact strongly. We are talking about uh, the strong norm. Because uh, the single function, which is a, um, a single function, is tight. This is the basic observation. So the function is tight. Hence, you cannot have a compact set made by families which are not tight. Because if, uh, if you can see that if it converges, then a family which converges in LP is tight. Okay. Well, it is in hand, and now we can state essentially the, the converse. So under, under the assumption of the theorem, if F is tight, then uh, F is compact. LP with the strong norm. And the assumption of the theorem is the continuity we expect to translation. So uniform continuity. So this is uniform continuity. Okay. And vice versa. So if it is uh, compact, then it's tight and uniformly continuous with translation. It's bounded tight and uniformly continuous. Okay, now we have the full characterization of uh, compact sets. Proof. Okay, one direction is uh, if you look at the proof, everything is fine, but uh, the point three, which is in the assumption. So this direction goes of uh, uh, point three is now the assumptions. So 
So the opposite direction is an exercise, so I just sketch it. Because uh, unfortunately time is running. And uh, so let's see the point. So I know that the family is convex. So assume that uh, is not uniformly continuous, is not bounded, or is non tight. One of the three. And then prove that is false. So by contradiction. And let's see. If it is not bounded, well, it's obvious. A compact set, an unbounded compact set in a metric space cannot be tight, cannot be compact, because you have sequences which are as far as you want. So this is uh, trivial. Is not uniform continuous. Continuous or not tight. So now what you do here, then there exists family Fn sequences with the two properties. For example, not uniformly continuous, which is such that Okay, the translation is not uniformly continuous. Or, well, Fn is not tight. Now I'm saying that, well, it's not tight. I can, let's see, in which now, now let me say the following that, uh, okay, this is the part of the exercise. But if n, f, n converts to f, so if I have a non, so if I have a sequence which converges, then how h, f, n is uniformly continuous and tight. Okay, this should be fixed a little bit better. I agree, and I live as an exercise. It's a nice exercise to fix it. And uh, why is that so? Because, uh, well, if it is converges, from some point on is the triangle inequality. For example, you can write Fn minus Fn less or equal than tau H Fn minus F minus tau h f plus tau h f minus f plus f minus f n. Okay, and then you observe that, okay, this is small for n uniformly large and this is uh, translation continuous because uh, a, a function f is uniform, is, the translation is continuous. Maybe we will see this point. What about tightness? Well, you have the mass that goes far apart, and each function is tight. It's clearly, you can find a sequence of functions which has uniform distance. So they cannot have converging subsequences. Okay, just uh, the last remark about uh, uh, all this stuff here. Uh, the next exercise, uh, well, there is an exercise here which states that, for example, a single function then is the translation is continuous in LP, which can be proven uh, directly by approximation. So let me now state the, la the last two results. So this theorem plus tightness solves the, our problem of strong compactness, no? And uh, so now we have uh, the following that, uh, um, let me copy the corollary here. Tightness uh, 
boundedness and uh, con translation continuity. is equivalent from components. One P. What about weak compactness? Well, one result is trivial. LP is reflexive, so I think weak, uh, weak star compact by and uh, reflexive space two topologies is uh, coincide with star and. Pardon, I, I can I don't understand. I'm sorry, the, the the audio was not clear. Can you repeat, please? Uh, I think in LP topology in a. Uh, Weak topology in LP, LP space, uh, all bounded sets is relatively compact by... The weak topology, no? Yeah, in, in weak topology, because weak and weak star topology is coincide and weak star topology... You know, yes, is weak topology is in LP with one infinity, yes. okay, then it is a convex uh, bounded that are Con the compact really sets. But okay. convexity and compact. Okay. Uh, yeah, closed yeah. and, and pre-compact and the closed. So if you want compact, closed are com weakly compact. Okay? In L infinity, these sets are, uh, well, the, the, the unit ball, not these sets, but the unit ball, Remember that in L infinity, the unit balls or balls are weakly star compact. And so there is still uh, one question open. We don't have, uh, in general, a weak star uh, topology in L1. So in L1, the natural weak star topology will be uh, L1 of K with compact set is contained in uh, the measure of K, the measure with signs, compact with sign, bounded measure with sign, which is equal to C of K star. So in L infinity, in L1, the weak star topology, the natural weak star topology should be this one. However, you see that uh, the closure of, uh, well, so the closure of L1 compact sets, uh, well, is, no, is not complete with respect to this topology. So because you, have, you can have sequences we convert to a delta. So indeed, the, the, is, this space is uh, much nicer from the point of view of compactness. So there is still one question left, and is uh, uh, what about uh, the, uh, the weak compact sets in L1? Then at the, end we, at the end of the story, we have uh, more or less the whole description of, uh, of these sets. <clears throat> I guess I forgot. I forgot the statement. F, a family F contained in L1, let's say of omega, but we, we, we stay in R in RN, just to be sure. Is weakly compact 
if, or we see relatively compact, pre-compact, let's say. If uh, F is tight, well, this cannot be avoided because of the, the examples down there uh, uh, are the same, and uniformly integrable. Uh, which is called sometimes equi, actually it's called equi-integrable. This is, but for some reason I use an equi, equi-integrable. Okay, let's discover, I don't want to say what is equi-integrable, so I want to let you discover uh, step by step. And uh, the idea to prove this thing is uh, the best, I mean, this is my, my feeling. It's always better to think what can go wrong. Okay. okay, this criteria is called the Danforth Petit, and it's quite important. Danforth. So, how to do that? So, we ask what can go wrong. So I'm, I'm thinking F in L1 as a, 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 a mass. So let's think something like this is Rn, this is R, and my function F, I imagine this is just volume. Now, the tightness, it tells me that uh, I cannot uh, essentially, here I have some bound which tells me that the mass outside here is small. So what I'm doing is that this mass, uh, if I, well, if it is positive and it converges weakly, it should converge also as a mass. If it is negative, we can have cancellation, but uh, what can go wrong here is that uh, I, how to make the mass to escape? Because I have, let's say, I have a, a sequence of function which has some mass here, and uh, if I can uh, the, make the, the, the mass to escape, uh, clearly I, have, I can have something which has norm one, but at the end becomes norm zero, and uh, for positive sets, you see that for F, for when I, the, well, the, the integral of f is a weak uh, function, it's a linear function. Okay, so the other way to escape, uh, I can, so I can escape horizontally, but I rule out because of uh, the tightness. So I can escape vertically. For example, I concentrate, so, so for example, something one over n times n it becomes higher and higher, and at the end, uh, the limit is zero. But the limit in this space is a Dirac delta. Because in this space, well, it's a sequence which is bound. It is in the unit pole. And then uh, it is weak star compact, the unit ball. So I have a limit. And the limit is the Dirac delta. Uh, and you see that it's a con is if this, uh, this uh, I mean, if the set is compact in L1, cannot have a weak limit, a weak star limit as a Dirac delta. Because uh, CK, in any case, is contained in infinity, so the test function in CK can be used as test function in the weak topology in L1. I'm sorry if I get, I'm, I'm trying to let you to understand why some con concept arises. Okay, so I just say, let give me uh, a criteria which is uh, this uniform, uh, this tightness, 
also vertically. Okay, so let's try the tightness vertically. So we need a vertical tightness. Okay, the, the, but the, the, let, let's come, go back to the tight. Tight means that if I take, in this case, some radius r, or some compact set, but essentially it's the ball of radius r, so if r is sufficiently large, the mass outside is as small as I want, no matter what is uh, the, the function. So the vertical tight, tightness would be that if I cut the function at the h, the quantity of f outside h is small. Okay. So can so I can I can state like uh, uh, let me state this way. So uh, for all h. Um, the integral of f, where f is larger than h, sorry, sorry, let's, let me, for all epsilon, there exists h such that the integral over f larger than h of modulus of f, the bag here, we are, usually the bag doesn't matter, if we start to measure, is less than uh, epsilon. This is exactly the way to say that, okay, when I cut, when, when I just look at the mass, which is where f is very high, uniformly, it is small. Okay? Now, we you see, we discover naturally what is the tightness. Then, how to do, how to use it? So sketch, this is not, uh, because essentially is the same as before. So sketch restrict f to f restricted to k, and then you cut max f minus h mean F H. So what I'm doing here, I'm cutting. So what what I'm doing here is that I cut this box, and here is the, the K, and here is the H. And uh, I, I just consider the functions f which are uh, inside the compact set. And, uh, okay, the graph is uh, cut in this way. Now you see that the argument will be the same, no? Because uh, what I know by the tightness and uh, the, comp the, the equintegrability So let's call this function f tilde. F, f tilde in L1 is less than epsilon if, let's say, k and H are uh, sufficiently large and uniformly in F. Oh, and now, last step, which is the trivial one.
but it's not the trivial one, it, but it's the same as before. I have to replace. So I have to, cho to show that this set of F tilde is weakly compact. Okay. So last step. Show that F tilde, which are all the F tilde, where F is in F, is weakly compact. Means what? Well, I can cover a weakly precompact. So here it, they have a I, I think I leave you for some exercise because it's the same because I use the weak compactness. Help. Because I know for free that uh, this set is weakly compact in LP. The bounded set, and uh, well, being uh, uniformly uh, being uniformly, um, so it's a bounded set in LP because it's bounded, and in particular, in LP bounded sets are uh, is a convex. Or it well it, it, the the weak closure is a uh, it's convex, and so it's a weak star with compact in NP, weak precompact. So the thing works also as in the other proof because now I have a, a weak precompact set, which is as close as I want to my is uniformly close to my set. Let's, let's stop here with this part because I'm running out of time. There, there is some discussion. This part is a little bit sketchy. I don't think it's going to be asked in, uh, in, uh, in the exam, but you need to know that, uh, that you have this concept of equi-integrability and you may forget the name, you may forget the tightness, you may forget whatever, but you have to remember about the example. So one is the mass which moves to infinity, and the other is the mass which moves to infinity vertically. So you want to have that uh, the, the functions, they weakly converge to functions. You certainly do not want to have uh, this concentration of mass, nor that the mass just flows away, because then you miss, you lose you, the control of what's happening. Uh, the discussion is more complicated, so le but let's stop here. Just uh, you have seen this uh, kind of proof, and uh, the line of the proof is is the same. So you construct the compact sets, and because of the assumptions, the distance is as close as you want, is uniformly close. Are there questions? Otherwise, we start with the second with the, the new subject, uh, which is much uh, easier. I start erasing now. So the new subject is, uh, well, the best spaces you can imagine here, which are Hilbert spaces. So 
where, where is the chopping gun? I don't know. Oh, Hilbert's face has face with a scalar product. So the, the idea is that these are spaces with a scalar product. We denote in this way. And uh, so this scalar product should have this, all the properties that we have for scalar product in R. So definition. I left my chalk somewhere, probably here. OK, so let's see. What is a scalar product? Is uh, well, for the scalar product, you need to have uh, the entries are two vectors. And uh, the scalar product in R is linear in each of the entry, in each one of the entries. So it is a, a bilinear form usually Banach space are denoted with, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, there are several notations, X maybe, but Hilbert space are always H. Okay, so, and uh, um, such a data. So if we think in finite dimension, finite dimension, remember that so this, uh, a bilinear form is a matrix, no? So in finite dimension, you have x, t, y is a bilinear. And a is a, a matrix in, uh, let's say, n times n. So when this guy is a, a, a scalar product, well, it should be symmetric. And strictly positive. So this is the symmetry. And then, uh, well, uh, you know that uh, the norm is computed. So if this is symmetric, you can say the norm of x squared is a x dx. OK, so you want this to never be 0. Uh, it should be positive, greater than 0, but for the case where x uh, is equal to 0. So A of U, U greater than 0, uh, and uh, if U is different than 0. For U equal to 0, by its linearity, U is automatically 0. <clears throat> OK, so uh, now we have a sequence of uh, simple inequalities which are deduced by these properties. And in the whole, uh, uh, or at least in half of, the, of this part, uh, you will observe that, uh, well, I think I find very useful to, to think it uh, in this way. Because uh, it's something like, uh, uh, let's say, to have uh, um, a, quadrat a quadratic form. It's almost a quadratic form. So x, t, a, x is actually a quadratic form. And then if you put one half, is uh, like a parabola with, uh, OK, the parabola with whose level set are ellipses governed by the eigenvalues of A. And this is, I think this is the, the uh, OK, I feel it useful to, to think in this way, because many computations are suggested because of this, uh, um, uh, this example. So here, let's start with the first inequality, which is Cauchy's vast. No. So let's take this guy. 
zero is less or equal than a u plus alpha v, u plus alpha v, because I use positivity. Now, bilinearity. Bilinearity, you see, is lambda like a quadratic form. So it's a u u plus 2 alpha symmetry, u v plus a v v. So alpha squared. I use the linearity and the symmetry here. Now you minimize. respect to alpha, where well, you discover that uh, the value is alpha equal to a minus a uv divided by a vv. substitute. So you discover zero less or equal than a u minus uh, a v u squared divided by a v v. Now we have the inequality, which is uh, a u v is less or equal than a u u a uh, v v to one half. Okay, so this is the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Now, the definition is now that uh, fine A u u equal to sum, so let's say to one half, this guy here. Oops, I'm not good. <coughs> and then uh, I'm saying that this is a norm. Okay, linearity is automatic. That is uh, zero only if this zero is okay. And finally, I need to prove the, the triangle inequality. So subadditivity. Or let's say u plus v squared. Sorry, this is u. A u u u, this function is a function of u. Okay, this is uh, by definition is a u plus v, u plus v, by definition, linearity to a u v plus a v v, Cauchy-Schwarz, u u plus 2 a, square root of a u u, square root of a v v, Well, and this is equal to the, squ the square root a u u. Squared, so by my notation. So take the square root and that's it. Okay, so we discover that uh, the scalar product, which are definite positive, so this is called definite positive, induces a natural norm, and so the space is at least a normal vector space. So when it is complete, we have now that it is a Hilbert space. H is complete with respect to the norm induced by the scalar product, then 
is Hilbert. Okay, so finally we arrive to the definition of Hilbert space. Now, another inequality is the parallelogram. Equality, no, inequality. Pardon? Equality, equality. So here, the parallelogram? Yes, equality, not inequality. Equality, yeah, wait, okay. Uh, what is the equality, sorry? Parallelogram law, just equality between two... Uh, uh, the, the par ah, yeah, yeah, okay, yes, but uh, <laughs> I have to write it. Okay, so you just, uh, it is an exercise. And in particular, uh, from this one, if you have a norm, normed space such that the norm satisfies this equality, then it induces scalar product. Okay, it is a, it's just, to obtain this from the assumption is just expand as we did before, and there is nothing to say. So, um, fundamental examples. L2 of omega with the scalar product fg, the integral over omega fx x dx, and uh, in particular L2 with the scalar product uv sum over n un vn. And the second one is really fundamental because essentially in the space that uh, in general it happens to, to be, this is a, um, well, isomorphic to any Hilbert space, any separable Hilbert space. So we are, uh, I mean, there exists uh, at the end uh, up to isomorphy a unique Hilbert space. Okay, so let's start with the fun now. Oh, no, there is still one result, sorry. Proposition or corollary. H is uniformly convex. Okay, the proof is this guy, no? There is nothing else to prove. So, proof. So, what I have to prove is that uh, the middle point is a, is a norm less than one whenever the two points are norm one and the distance is larger than some fixed quantity. So from parallelogram, u plus v half is equal to, well, one minus u minus v half squared, sorry, if u E equal to one. And that's it. No? Because so if uh, this is larger than, so this is less than one minus epsilon if this is larger than epsilon. larger than epsilon, then square less than one minus epsilon. And that's the definition of uniform continuity. Actually, here is uh, even better. Particular corollary, H is reflexive. which we know for these examples. And uh, the proof, uh, well, 
And you see it's much easier here to prove that it is reflexive and, uh, well, it's immediate. So now let's start with the fun. Uh, let's go there. So sorry, I just switch. From now on, we the scalar product is denoted by um, by this symbol. I forget about what is it. It's just this symbol. So now the theorem is a projection. On convex closed sets. So uh, in general, uh, if I give you, uh, in, here, in Banach spaces, you, you don't have, a, given a convex closed set, you don't have a minimal point. The, a point w and the point outside, you don't have the minimal point, uh, uh, the distance which realize the minimal point. But here instead, yes, so let's do this. <coughs> I stated so. K is convex closed and non empty. And right. one comment. I think this theorem was holds for what uniformly convex Banach space. For Banach space is false. We can generalize this theorem. Pardon? We can generalize this theorem for Banach spaces. I think Banach space is uniformly continuous. It's what sufficient condition for. You need to use the compactness of uh, the weak star compactness or the weak compactness of the ball. So if the Banach space uh, is uh, is reflexive, then you have uh, a minimizing sequences, and the functional is uh, lower is convex, lower semi-continuous, the distant function. And in, then you have uh, that this weakly converge, and that minimum, that limit is realizes the minimum. So it's true for uh, reflexive Banach spaces. Ah, thank you. Is it criterion? Pardon? No. Is it criterion? Namely, we can again generalize this theorem. For example, non-reflexive Banach spaces. There is there some generalization? generalization? Uh, the end of story, uh, reflexive Banach space? I think for other Banach space can still work, but uh, I don't see any general condition to say that the minimum, because, uh, um, because uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, there are some, some strange uh, geometry thing in Banach spaces, so, um, I, I'm, I'm not so sure, I'm, uh, it could, I, I, I wouldn't say anything. I mean, I'm not sure. It could be that if any convex set has a, a minimum, so the resistance projection operator for every convex uh, and closed set, then the, the space is reflexive. But I wouldn't, I'm not so sure. But it sounds uh, reasonable. Thank you. Because uh, per okay, I can check. I believe that this has been answered. My feeling, but I'm just a feeling. I didn't think the question is that uh, if any convex set, convex or set, uh, as a projection operator then uh, you, you are in uh, the reflexive case. But okay, certainly for the reflexive work. Indeed, one of the proof, the easiest proof is to say is reflexive and then you deduce it. We do it explicitly, how, however. So with the theory here, uh, we do the theory completely disjoint from the previous one, just for fun. F belonging to H, then, 
exist a unique u in k such that f minus u, so the distance, is the minimum f minus v, which is by definition the distance of f by 2k. And actually, in Banach space, we have also the characterization. Moreover, U is characterized so F minus U, uh, V minus U, less or equal than zero for all V in K. So the meaning of the second condition is that uh, by F and I take its projection U, okay, all the other points, they stay on the negative side of the functional who's determined by this vector, which is FU. Okay, so it is the, the the meaning of the second condition. Okay, so let's give the proof now. So we denote this guy, U is a PK of F. Proof. So let BN minimize it. So now we compute the parallelogram row. for f minus vn plus f minus vm, two different values divided by two, plus the difference of the two, which is vn minus vm, two squared, equal to one half f minus vn squared, squared, one half f minus vm squared. Okay, so this is what is F minus Vn plus Vm squared, half squared, so the middle point. So let's pass to the limit uniformly in N and M. Just to see. So this guy converts to the distance. This converts to the distance. And this converts to the distance. So which means that if n and m is sufficiently large, they are close to the distance. Okay? Because this is being the middle point, no? at some point is closer than, than the, the, the average of two. The distance is a convex function. The distance squared is convex. Oh, so what I discovered, I discovered that Vn. M converges to zero as N and M goes to infinity. So it is a Cauchy sequence. At this point, since being a Cauchy, uh, I have that uh, there exists a limit, and this is a strong limit. So the limit B, U, let's say U, N, okay, realizes the minimum because the distance is continuous uh, with a strong convergence.
So the, this, the difference here with respect to the proof using reflexivity is that uh, here I have the strong convergence, which you can in some sense also deduce from the uniform uh, um, con convexity of the ball. Okay. But the other one using only reflexivity, you have the weak convergence and then you pass you the lower semi-continuity. But here, find nicely, it is uh, the, the strong convergence. So now let's see the second characterization. Okay, the uniqueness is because of the proof for any sequence. They cannot converge to different uh, objects simply because they are still a Cauchy sequence. So let's see the characterization. So, um, okay, take let W in K and compute for T01. So what I have by definition is, is that F minus my projection u squared, this is the minimum, so it's less or equal than f minus, well, it is convex, so it is 1 minus t u plus t w squared. Equal to f minus u plus t u minus w squared. Now we expand f minus u squared plus 2t, now the scalar product. Let me call them with the minus. Squared uh, u minus w squared. So if I simplify, I discover that 2t f minus u w minus u uh, will be less or equal than t squared u minus w squared for all t. Say 0, 1, just to be in particular, divide by t, let t tends to zero, and you obtain the inequality. This thing here is less or equal than zero. Okay, now we have to prove the reverse. So suppose that uh, I have a point u which satisfies this guy, then u is unique and it is the minimum. Vice versa, f minus u squared minus f minus v squared, u satisfies is such that f minus u, u, v minus u, less or equal than zero. And now we take v in k and we compute this object. I want to show that is less than zero. Well, this is what? <coughs> So this is again f minus u squared plus minus f minus u plus, okay, minus v minus u squared equal to, I develop the thing, so the square cancel, so I get f minus u v minus u minus v minus u squared. 
but I know that this guy is less or equal than zero, and this guy certainly is less or equal than zero, so this is less or equal than zero. So I get that u is the minimum. Now let's prove that there exists only one point. Well, actually, I can already deduce that being the minimum, it is unique. And um, indeed, I, I don't know why you know, I need to add it, this thing over here. Uh, okay, in any case, I'll, I'll, this is in the book, this thing. So I want to prove that there exists only one u such that f minus u, d minus u is less or equal than zero. And I can do, well, I can use this fact being the minimum is unique because of, of, a, of a uniform, com strict convexity of the norm, actually. But here, so I get, if I have two, satisfies f minus u1, d minus u1, less or equal than zero, and the other one, which is f minus u2, v minus u2, less or equal than zero, well, is the standard stuff. You take here u2, here u1, you add, and you sum up into f minus, sorry, u2 minus u1, 1 minus u2, sorry, u2 minus u1, less or equal than zero. And uh, being coercive, this implies u1 equal to u2. OK, so I don't think this is particularly smart. What is smart in, is instead that the, the minimal characterization gives that the projection operator is one Lipschitz. Stop where I finish here, but it's not. Proposition CK H into K is one Lipschitz, which is uh, clear. I mean, not N because the projection they shrink distance. So you can have something which go far. What I mean by this is that PK of X of f, k, g, f, g. Proof, the proof is inside here. Because you, you have that uh, f minus p, k, f, and here is uh, any projection particular p, k, g minus p, k, f, less or equal than zero, and vice versa, g minus p k g, k f minus p k g, less or equal than zero. So now we add, then we discover that, so you have f plus, so, uh, here I have to reverse, so f minus g, p k minus p k f, Here, when I reverse, I have uh, P plus PKG minus PKF norm squared, less or equal than, uh, there should be a minus somehow, uh, for some reason it is less or equal than zero. No, it's correct, less or equal than zero. And so I have that PKG, PKF, squared is less or equal than, okay, this distance, g minus f, pkg minus pkf, and then, uh, okay, let's finish with this guy. So this norm, so it's less or equal than this norm times this norm, and so when you erase, you deduce this guy over here. Okay? Um, last results now, uh, 
let me write here. There are just two results. Um, So the corollary, the projection on a linear subspace. So if I have M, the closed linear subspace, F belonging to H, then there exists a unique U in, a, in M such that, okay, it realizes the minimum, Cm of F, and, okay, so this is the, is the thing at minimal distance, but let's look at the condition here. Because uh, the V now is in a linear space, and U is inside the linear space, so this guy is completely free to be in the linear space. So the condition will be that F minus U, V is equal to zero for all V in the linear space. So I have only to show that this condition reduces to the, that one, or that one implies this one. So the proof we know that F minus U, W minus U, is less or equal than zero for all W in M. But now, since U belongs to M, then set B equal to uh, U, uh, um, W minus U, and then clearly for all W means for all V in M. And since V goes to the minus V, so you get F minus U V less or equal than zero for all V in M, and being a linear subspace, it can only be zero because you can, can take minus V. Minus V belongs to M, and then you deduce F minus U V equal to zero. And now you see that this is really the orthogonal projection. So we discover something uh, which is uh, well, so you have, a, 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 we discovered that there exists an orthogonal projection on a, a linear, linear subspaces, and in particular, let me comment this fact, because it's in Banach space is false. Actually, it is true if and only if uh, that uh, the space is uh, Hilbert. I know this fact, I never look at the proof, however. So the remark, if M is containing H, then there exists M orthogonal, which is what are all the vectors orthogonal, which is closed, so this is closed. Uh, this is closed too, and H is really the sum. M, so for each, which means for each F in H, there exist unique G and uh, UV, let's say U in M, V in M, pra, M orthogonal, such that F is equal to U plus V, and uh, U, V is equal to zero. So this is the orthogonal decomposition into components. And, uh, uh, so a fact like this one, so the fact that you can, you have this uh, sum, this unique decomposition of vectors is true for if you, I give you closed subsets only if it is only Hilbert. 
in Hilbert you get that it's still, uh, it's orthogonal. So how to deduce this fact? Well, just observe that uh, if you, U would be the projection and uh, V would be F minus the projection. Okay, so are there questions? Not so see you on Monday. And as I say every time, if you need any quest, any question, any additional explanation, just drop me an email and we arrange a meeting. Thank you, Professor. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome.